seems to me that virtually every time in public discourse, the topic of the modern scientific project, some new discovery, and the Christian faith, particularly the Catholic faith, come up, if they ever come up in tandem, the following series of events happens in newsrooms across the world. Everybody goes into a dark back room, they break out the crystal ball, and they have a seance where they call forth the specter of Galileo Galilei. And then they and the specter then proceed to say all sorts of foolish things about Galileo, the church, and the relationship between faith and science. So what I'm hoping to do today with y'all is essentially tell you the story of the Galileo affair. Um, and in doing so, bring forth all of the prominent players and the prominent issues that were at hand and what you might be able to take away from this. I do this, take this talk as more of an invitation, meaning, look, I want to give you some tools, whatever you take from it, so that you can make use of those tools as you think about this affair and the broader issues connected, and maybe those tools can also help you with your students, all right? So our story, famously, begins way before Galileo. It begins in 1543 with Nicholas Copernicus. Uh, Copernicus was not a priest. He was a canon, a member of the minor orders, most probably uh, was a canon attached to a particular church so he could draw an income without having to work for it so that he could pursue scholarly things. Happened all the time, y'all. In 1543, he published De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium, on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres, in which he famously argues, contrary to the system of Aristotle, mathematized by Ptolemy, that the sun, in fact, was the center of celestial mechanics, heliocentrism, and that the earth revolved around it, geokineticism. What you see on the board here is a medieval Christian interpretation of the Aristotelian Ptolemaic cosmos. It is geocentric, so you see in the middle, there is us. You see Earth surrounded by a layer of air and then fire, the lighter the elements supposedly were. And then you see this surrounded by a series of concentric circles. Um, there were thought to be spheres or crystalline spheres made up of ether, this sort of diaphanous element. And embedded in each of these spheres was a heavenly body. So you can see Moon, Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and then the eighth heaven was the firmament of fixed stars where all of the rest of the stellar bodies resided. Ninth heaven and then the tenth heaven, which contains the primu mobile, the first moved mover, this cosmic body that moves all of the rest of celestial mechanics in response to its experience of God. In Christian versions, this might have been some sort of angel, this kind of thing. Each of these spheres follows a perfectly circular orbit. If you're a pagan, from and for all eternity. If you're a Christian, from the beginning of time until the second coming of Jesus. And you see surrounding this, which is essentially surrounding creation, is Imperium Heaven, home of all the elect and of God. So in one way, the image is quite beautiful. You have the uncreated and the eternal, not before the created, but surrounding it at every point and at every moment. Now, for Aristotle and most medievals, the place of birth, death, growth, decay, generation, corruption is exclusively the terrestrial sphere. This is the only place in the cosmos where those things occur. In the heavens, its only motion was a perfectly circular motion. All other motions and changes were off limits. Famously, this is what Copernicus argues for. And this is from De Revolutionibus, by the way. This is in some ways, and only in some ways, familiar to you. So we have Earth, in the, we have Sun in the middle, and then each of the spheres contains one of the planets on the way out to Saturn. However, what's wrong with this picture from your perspective and mine? We're so smart as mine. The orbits are circular, not elliptical. Well, it's going to take a while to figure that out. Now, Copernicus, he completed De Revolutionibus in 1532, 10 years before its publication. And he was known as a heliocentrist in his lifetime by friends and other intellectuals. 
He was a well-known polymath also. He had a doctor of canon law. He was also a physician, physician to a bishop who was his uncle. Well, in 1533, while well, this is publicly known but not yet published, in Rome, a man named Johann Albrecht Wittmannstadt, doesn't matter what his name is, he was the secretary of Clement VII, gave a series of lectures to Pope Clement on Copernicus's ideas. The only record of these lectures we have is from Wittmannstadt, and the Pope's reaction apparently was, this is pretty cool, and that was it. That's a paraphrase. <laughs> now look, this is 1533. 100 years later, in 1633, let's just say another pope's reaction is not anywhere in the same universe as pretty cool. <laughs> It'll be exactly the opposite. Hopefully this talk will give you some context and reasons why that was the case. Now, when this was published, Copernicus, Copernicus delayed its publication because he feared scorn. He dedicated it on the vice of a couple of cardinals. He dedicated it to Pope Paul III. And it landed with pretty much a thud. As it turns out, Copernicus's model and the mathematical calculations based on the model were only marginally more accurate than Ptolemy's. And I mean marginally. Better for what were called only the inferior planets, Mercury, Venus, and the Moon. As an instrument of calculation and prediction, it wasn't much better, if any better, than the reigning instrument, which was Ptolemy. And Copernicus's theories as a literal account of the cosmos had almost no acceptance in, its life, in his lifetime. First, on what they would have called, what we would call, scientific grounds. First, it violates what seems to be common sense observation of the motion of the sun and the heavenly bodies. I'll never forget my kids, one in particular, mind blown. And I said, baby, you see, that's not all moving. We're the ones moving. She was like, what? <laughs> right. Two, it violated many principles of Aristotle's physics. So, for example, Aristotle thought the four primary elements, earth, air, fire, and water, and I think of that, I always think of the cartoon Avatar that my kids watch, each had one natural motion. So fire being the lightest, it was to rise, which is why it's in the outer sphere. Earth, and I can't drop this because I will break it, its one natural motion is to fall in a rectilinear path toward the center of the earth, the heaviest body. On Copernicus's account, Earth has two motions, neither of which are this. It has orbital motion and then diurnal or rotational motion. Also, there are other sort of common sense observational reasons. When you drop a heavy object from the mast of a ship, say, it seems to fall in a rectilinear path, not at a slant, as one might expect if the Earth was moving. And finally, the predicted, or the supposedly should be predicted phenomenon of stellar parallax, because if we're moving, things ought to be doing this, was in no way apparent. It could not be seen. Now Copernicus, like Aristarchus from the third century BC, argued, well, we all know that parallax as a visual phenomenon becomes less apparent the further you are away from the bodies in question. In fact, you can be so far from two bodies that parallax is not observable at all. Now, however, most scientists, natural philosophers, astronomers of this day thought, well, wait a minute. If this is the case, wouldn't that make the cosmos sort of inelegantly large? Why would the firmament of fixed stars be so far away? And besides, many, not all, thought that the visible diameter of stars was their actual diameter which would seem mitigate against them being so far away. So this is just a smattering, a taste of the scientific arguments against Copernicus's position. It also was rejected on theological grounds. Chris had mentioned already that there were several biblical passages that honestly appear, and sometimes more than appear, to assume or assert geostaticism, the earth is motionless, and geocentrism, the earth as the center of celestial mechanics. Now, there are several passages. Uh, Psalm 19, verses 5 to 6, Ecclesiastes 1, chapter 1, verse 5. But the queen mother of all, oops, the queen mother of all, actually, it's not up there, never mind. The queen mother of all is from the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 to 13. It reads this way. Then spoke Joshua, 
to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the men of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, quote, Son, stand thou still at Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the nation took vengeance on its enemies. So the plain sense of the passage, unanimously interpreted by all of the fathers of the church, which we will arrive at later, is this. God stops celestial mechanics around the earth to lengthen the day, to give Israel time to finish the beatdown. Once the beatdown is finished, everything starts over again. This and other passages seem to mitigate on biblical grounds against Copernicanism. Now, Copernicus's book received a few ecclesial censures in local jurisdictions, but it received no universal ecclesial censure of any sort. It was largely ignored. However, and don't forget this as my talk progresses, there was a Dominican named Giovanni Maria Tolosani who died in 1549, just seven years after Copernicus, six years after Copernicus, who wrote a book called On the Most Pure Truth of Holy Scripture. In this book, he claims that fellow Dominican Bartolomeo Spina, who was master of the sacred palace and therefore head of the Holy Office, read the Roman Inquisition, wanted to condemn Copernicus's book, but died before he could do so. Now, don't forget Tolosani's book because it will end up in the hands of one of our players in a few minutes. So Copernicanism comes and it goes. Now enter Galileo Galilei, born in 1564. Galileo, with no equivalent of a terminal degree, is an utter mathematical savant. And because of this, he has first a professorship in mathematics at Pisa, and then at the University of Padua, uh, wherein he was competing for that job from among other people, one Giordano Bruno, who we'll talk about at the end of the talk. Galileo had always been critical of Aristotle's account of motion. His preferences were more, we might say, Archimedean, where he preferred to think of motion in terms of mechanics that you would model with geometry. In that way, a prescient view of how we will eventually see motion. Now, while at Padua, he conducts a series of experiments. Some of them we would qualify as actual experiments. Some of them more thought experiments in geometry. All on the nature of terrestrial mechanics and falling bodies. And in very short order, he comes up with a version of the law of inertia, the components of motion, horizontal speed and vertical acceleration, the nature of free fall, that all projectiles follow a parabolic arc. And he never publishes this. This just ends up as part of classroom lecture stuff. Well, in 1609, Galileo improves upon a brand new invention, the telescope. And he makes the first telescope useful for observing celestial phenomena. By our standards, utterly primitive, only if atmospheric conditions were right did it work, which means most of the time it did not work. <laughs> but when conditions were right, Galileo was all of a sudden able to observe things that no one had ever been able to see before. So within a year, he makes a series of discoveries that catapult him into virtual pan-European intellectual celebrity. He discovers the Jovian satellites. Jupiter has moons. Um, of course, he names them after Cosimo de' Medici, the Medician stars, and hoping to get a patron, which he in fact does get. Because of these discoveries, he becomes the court mathematician and upon his insistence, natural philosopher in the court of Cosimo de' Medici. Galileo discovers mountains and valleys on the moon, that Venus has phases. Along with Christoph Scheiner, he's the co-discoverer of sunspots. And he correctly asserts that sunspots are on the sun, not bodies revolving around the sun, and that the sun has diurnal or rotational motion. He sees for the first time innumerable other stars that no one had ever been able to see before. He also correctly hypothesizes that the Milky Way and nebulae are dense collections of stars. It's because of these discoveries, particularly the phases of Venus, the Jovian satellites, and sunspots, that make Galileo, for the first time in his life, a convicted Copernican. 
before these discoveries, everything we have written by him is ambivalent toward Copernicus. But Galileo sees these discoveries as best explained on Copernicus, Copernicus's celestial mechanics because they are inexplicable in terms of Ptolemy's celestial mechanics. So Galileo becomes known amongst intellectual circles as a Copernican. And even in the book, The Sidereal Messenger, where he lays out all of these discoveries, um, he plays his Copernican cards. Now, about four or five things are going to happen in the space of two, three years that will make Copernicanism and its compatibility with the Bible, and hence Galileo's position, the church will have to confront it and make a decision for the first time. And famously, this is a decision in which Galileo is involved and in which he's caught. So the first event, in 1633, Father Benedetto Castelli, this does sound, uh, uh, Lawrence Principe, who's a historian of science at John Hopkins, calls this an Italian soap opera. Like a telenovela. Okay, so, Father Benedetto Castelli, a Benedictine mathematician, protege and student of Galileo, is having breakfast with Christina of Lorraine, the Grand Duchess, his patron's mama, Cosimo de' Medici's mother. And they're talking with other court philosophers who are committed Aristotelian. And the Grand Duchess asks Castelli about Galileo's Copernicanism and the Joshua passage. So Castelli answers as best he can. He then writes to Galileo and says, all right, Galileo, this is what happened. These are the answers I gave. So Galileo, for the first time, puts his position on the matter down on paper. So he writes a letter to Castelli where he explains his position. Two years later, in 1615, he writes an extended, masterful version of this letter, now dedicated to the Grand Duchess Christina which is a bit of a farce, by the way. It's not really meant for her, as we're going to see, in which he systematically lays out his position, specifically in terms of the problem of biblical interpretation. The first letter gets copied and circulated. The second letter is only circulated among intellectuals and clerics in Rome, a very small circle. It doesn't become public in a big way until after Galileo's condemnation. I'm going to treat the two letters as a composite. I'm going to treat the two letters as a composite. So Galileo makes essentially four claims in these letters that where, he's, where he basically marks out his territory, his position. The first claim he makes, that in biblical interpretation, in principle, not as a strategy to solve difficulties with the text, but in principle, whenever, quote, excuse me, physical problems are concerned, we might say scientific matters, that one, in principle, ought to first consult the best scientific knowledge available and not start with what seems to be the plain sense of the biblical passage. And that in every case, the biblical passage ought to be interpreted in terms of what we know to be the case scientifically. He puts it, nope, I don't have that one on there either. Never mind. He puts it this way. I think that in discussion of physical problems, we ought to begin not from the authority of scriptural passages, but from sense experiences and necessary demonstrations. So he lays out what is essentially a novel interpretive policy. It's an old policy as a tactic to solve difficulties in the text. You'll see it comes from St. Augustine. But Galileo wants to use it thoroughly and always and in principle. Two, when it comes to physical problems, what the sacred authors do is accommodate divine revelation to the ordinary understandings of common people or what appears to the senses. So for example, the sun appears to rise and set. Everything appears to move around us. So the biblical author expresses himself in such a way. Full well knowing, Galileo thinks, in virtue of inspiration, he knows the real deal about the cosmos, which of course is Copernicus. This position has a long pedigree from Augustine through St. Thomas. Third, a geocentric reading of Joshua, according to Galileo's exegesis, requires the prior commitment of geocentrism. 
in order to get geocentrism out of the passage. And Galileo says, at least in this way, sensibly. Of course the church fathers unanimously interpreted this in terms of geocentrism and Aristotle and Ptolemy. Because this is what they thought had been proved about the nature of the cosmos to begin with. And finally, the main purpose of divine revelation is not to teach us about physical phenomena, matters that are, quote, indifferent to salvation. Here he's quoting St. Augustine. But rather salvific ones. So Galileo was fond of quoting Cardinal Baronius, or sometimes we say Cardinal Baronio in its Italian version. Scripture teaches us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. And Galileo even offers his own reading of Joshua 10 on Copernican grounds. What does God do? He stops the diurnal motion of the sun, which stops all celestial mechanics. You get the same result. And actually has a bit of a tortured exegesis to show how this coheres better with Copernicanism than Aristotle and Ptolemy. Now, in this letter to the Grand Duchess, Galileo uses St. Augustine's literal commentary on Genesis, which Chris has already referred to, masterfully. Every other page has a reference or long block quote from it. So Galileo gathers from this, and he only encounters it, this text from Augustine, to write the letter to the Grand Duchess. And he becomes a student and a master of Augustinian as exegesis right away. So this is Galileo's position. The second thing happens. On December 20th of 1614, at the church of Santa Maria Novella, if you ever go to Florence, you're going to see that church, a Dominican, Father Tommaso Caccini, is given the homily that day. He's the celebrant. Guess what the epistle reading is for that day? Joshua 10. So Caccini preaches this homily where he excoriates Copernicus, Copernicanism, mathematicians, astronomers, and in a not-so-veiled way, Galileo. So at the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles, when the Lord ascends into heaven, I'm not going to give you the Latin, but the angels tell the apostles as a gate-mouthed, right? Men of Galilee, why do you stare at the heavens? Caccini changes the Latin. Men of Galilee, why do you stare at the heavens? The church is full of Galileo's friends and admirers. He pisses all of them off. He eventually has to give a formal apology to Galileo. Now, here's an interesting thing. Tolosani's book I mentioned earlier is in the library at the convent of San Marco, the Dominican convent of San Marco in Florence. We have Tommaso Caccini's marginal notes. So he thinks, I know Copernicus, you follow what I mean? I know Copernicism is bad for all these other reasons. It was on the verge of condemnation anyway. Well, as it turns out, Caccini was in league with a group of other men, philosophers and also mostly Dominicans, who think Galileo is an intellectual bad apple, is deforming the minds of his students, and must be stopped. They were called the Pigeon League after a man named Ludovico Colombe, Colombe's pigeon in Italian. So Galileo is paranoid. They're all plotting against me. It's actually true. They were all plotting against him. Sometimes conspiracy theories are true. Now. Another thing, 1615, Father Paolo Antonio Foscarini, a Carmelite, mathematician and astronomer, wants to defend Copernicanism and show its compatibility with the Bible. Instead of publishing a book, he writes a letter to his superior, which is just a front, in order to get this out into the public. Well, this book has to go before the Roman censor of books. And now the index of forbidden books has to make a decision whether this is going to be published or not. And finally, in the same year, Father Niccolo Lorini, OP, Dominican, friend and confrere of Caccini, complains formally to the Holy Office that maybe unintentionally, Galileo and his followers are heretics and spreading heresy. And he shows the letter to Castelli as proof as it turns out, um, the Holy Office decides there are only three or four problematic expressions in this letter. Galileo provides them with another copy which doesn't have those expressions. As it turns out, Lorini's copy is the genuine one. Galileo hands them a doctorate copy to make sure those, <laughs> make sure those expressions are excised and changed. 
But the Holy Office essentially laughs the complaint out of the room. There's absolutely nothing to see here. However, they now have to make a decision about Copernicanism. And what do they do? Well, they do what everybody like them does. They outsource the problems to experts because they have no idea. So they assemble a panel, mostly of Dominicans, and no one has expertise in astronomy. And they ask this panel to examine two propositions. So listen carefully. One, the first proposition is heliocentrism. Quote, the sun is the center of the world and completely devoid of locomotion. So that's proposition one. Proposition two, geokineticism. The earth is not the center of the world, nor motionless, but it moves as a whole of itself and also with diurnal motion. Here diurnal meaning rotational. They come back with a majority report four days. So all of them have been thinking about this and there's a way in which the cards had been dealt in advance. This panel of experts unanimously finds Proposition 1, heliocentrism, to be, quote, foolish and absurd in philosophy, read in our jargon scientifically, and, quote, formally heretical in theology. Proposition 2, geokineticism, they find to be equally false and absurd in philosophy, but only, quote, erroneous in faith in theology. So not formal heresy, but a bad idea. Now the final report of the Holy Office in the Index of Forbidden Books does not use that language. Cardinal Caetani, Bonifacio Caetani, and Cardinal Maffeo Barberini, don't forget this guy, intervene directly to make sure that the final report in the authoritative document drops formally heretical and erroneous in faith. Instead, it's replaced with, quote, false and altogether opposed to Holy Scripture, and therefore cannot be defended or held. So it's because of the intervention of these two men, Copernicanism is not declared formally heretical. So circulation of Copernicus's book was suspended until corrected. There were about a dozen passages that asserted the literal truth of Copernicanism, rather than Copernicanism as a mathematical fiction, which we'll talk about in a minute. And it took a decade to do this, by the way. Foscarini's book was put on the Index of Forbidden Books, a creation of the Council of Trent. Um, another work on Job by a Spanish author, Diego de Zuniga, which argues the same thing. It's put on the Index of Forbidden Books. Well, in February 1616, Pope Paul V asked Cardinal Robert Bellarmine, that is, St. Robert Bellarmine, to find Galileo and inform him of the index's decision and to ask him to comply with the index's decision. Galileo had already been in Rome trying to garner up support so that Copernicanism would not be condemned, by the way. He had been in Rome the whole year trying to plead his case with friends to churchmen, etc. So he meets with Bellarmine, and Galileo agrees. Now, what exactly Galileo agreed to, I'll leave you in a bit of suspense. But two months later, three months later, in May, Galileo summons Bellarmine and says, look, I've agreed to this. People are talking around Rome as if I'm under investigation by the Inquisition. I'm a good Catholic, right? I'm a good Catholic. Bellarmine says, sure, man. So Bellarmine writes him up this certificate, which Galileo will carry with him, kind of like Pascal with a little thing in his jacket, for the rest of his days, basically clearing him of any wrongdoing. And it reads this way. After an introduction, which states that Galileo is not now, nor has he ever been under suspicion, on the contrary, he has only been notified of the declaration made by the Holy Father and published by the Sacred Congregation of the Index, whose content is that the doctrine attributed to Copernicus, that the earth moves around the sun and the sun stands at the center of the world without moving east to west, is contrary to Holy Scripture and therefore cannot be defended or held. That last line is identical to the Holy Office's decision. 
Galileo puts that in his pocket, and he goes on his way. Now, Galileo knew Bellarmine personally. He had been in contact with him in person and by letter that whole year about this affair. Bellarmine famously wrote a letter to Father Foscarini, the guy who wanted to publish the book under the auspices of a letter to his superior. And in this letter, which is essentially cc'd to Galileo, it is meant for Galileo also, Bellarmine lays out his position on the matter. This is important because Bellarmine's position is as good as we have of what would be representative of, we might say, the majority position of churchmen of his time, and particularly those in authority. Um, in the introduction, Bellarmine says, look, Foscarini, you and Galileo have been so prudent to speak only suppositionally and not literally. What does he mean? For, Ga for Bellarmine, what astronomers do, don't forget astronomy is a subset or a subdiscipline of mathematics. So notice, Galileo is a mathematician. To be a mathematician and to be an astronomer is to be the same. From Bellarmine's position, what do astronomers do? They create mathematical fictions in order to account for celestial events, make calendars, and make predictions. Bellarmine thinks Ptolemy's system is just a series of math transparent mathematical fictions, which are what? It's a supposition in order to get an outcome. He says it is a very different thing to say that this is literally how the heavens go. So you see the difference. To speak suppositionally is fine. Bellarmine says, hey, speaking literally is not only likely to irritate all scholastic philosophers, which it did, but he said it also seems to render Holy Scripture false and is therefore harmful to the faith. Bellarmine says, too, as you know, Galileo, the Council of Trent has forbidden explicitly any departure from the consensus of the fathers in interpreting a given biblical passage in matters of faith and morals. You remember one of the things the Reformation's pivots on are interpretations of fathers like Augustine. So he says, Galileo, you got to be careful because what you did in the letter to the Grand Duchess, which you gave to me to read, essentially ran afoul of the condemnation or the condemnation of Trent. But then Bellarmine says, finally, okay, fine, look. If Copernicanism can be proved, he says, by demonstration, conclusively proved, then of course we would have to interpret Scripture differently. Or he says, and I quote, say we do not know what it means. But Bellarmine adds, I will only believe it if one can be shown to me directly, and I don't think one is forthcoming. So Bellarmine tends to think that this is not likely because on the one hand, astronomy is so obscure, how in the hell do we know what goes on up there for real? And two, the biblical witness seems so strong in this regard that it ought to be believed. Make no mistake, Bellarmine has no Aristotelian dog in the hunt whatsoever. He thinks Aristotle and Ptolemy got it wrong also. We have a series of lectures he gave as a priest at Louvain where he gives his own version of celestial mechanics and shows how certain propositions of Aristotle are themselves incompatible with the Bible. Aristotle said the heavens are unchanging. The Bible says they are, they do change, etc. He has his own celestial mechanics based on the philosophy he likes and biblical passages. And in any event, uh, the view that the heavens were unchanging had been eroding very quickly. So in 1572, um, a nova was witnessed by Tycho Brahe and several other people, which goes completely against the notion of an unchanging sort of perfect heavens. Now, both Galileo and Bellarmine basically agreed to the following, that what we would call scientific facts are utterly relevant in interpreting the Bible. And that scripture is inspired and inerrant in all respects. They agreed that two, if properly understood, there is a complete concordance between whatever scripture is asserting and whatever reason knows to be true. 
because they both believe, of course, that the truth is one. They essentially agreed, and so did every player in this drama, that there was no in principle opposition between faith and reason. If it's true, it's true, and the truth is one because the source of the truth is one. However, and if you all remember when your mama tell you the most important thing about the however is what comes after, not comes before. <laughs> however, they disagreed first on what constituted proof. Um, this is actually a very messy thing historically. But one thing we do know, Galileo didn't have any proof. Every single, one more time, every single data point of Galileo's, the Jovian satellites, the phases of Venus, the sun's diurnal motion, could be explained by alternative versions of celestial mechanics. This is Tycho Brahe's model of celestial mechanics. It is geocentric and static. You have the moon around the earth. Everything else orbits around the sun, which orbits around the earth. Not many astronomers thought this got it right either. The point is, alternative models could explain Galileo's data just as well as Copernicanism, models that were geocentric. So notice, from Bellarmine's position, Aristotle and Ptolemy are not important. That is not important to them. Galileo has a favorite proof, which turns out to be utterly wrong. Galileo's favorite proof was on, or were concerned, the tides. And he, it was his favorite because it was the most empirically near to us. So what explains tidal motion? The Earth's rotation, sort of like sloshing water in a bowl. He dismisses Kepler's correct lunar explanation as a mere... Uh, mere occult forces, you know, this kind, of, this kind of superstitious thing. So Galileo's favorite proof is, in fact, no proof at all. As it turns out, the proof, or what we would account as proof for heliocentrism, took place over a period of time. It took quite a long time, actually. So it's really not until Newton's Principia in 1687 where Newton gives a cogent framework, um, both cosmological and mathematical framework, to really think in heliocentric terms. Um, it's not until 1729 the English astronomer James Bradley discovers what's called the aberration of starlight. Um, so if you've ever looked at a photograph of cars on a freeway and you get the cool light trails at night, that kind of thing, Bradley discovers the stars leave these. And it's not until Friedrich Bessel in 1838 that stellar parallax is shown to be greater than zero. So this is the final empirical nail in the coffin, you might say. And another difference between Galileo and Bellarmine I've alluded to already. Bellarmine thinks astronomy is an instrumentalist enterprise. It creates fictions for the sake of getting certain predictive outcomes. Galileo, along with people like Kepler, thinks astronomy is a realistic enterprise where one, by way of it, and instruments, the telescope, for you and I, using an instrument to magnify sense experience in such a way that we can see, hear, etc., some micro or macro phenomenon of the cosmos. For us, that's just how many branches of science operate, correct? They couldn't operate in any other way. This idea is brand new. Remember, Bellarmine's position implicit is, how in the hell does anybody know how this works? Which is why we might need scripture to tell us. This is changing. Now remember, um, part of Galileo's genius lays in his mathematization of physics, that we think of the language of physics as mathematics is in part due to pioneers like Galileo. Finally, um, there's a biblical problem where he and Bellarmine disagree. Although both of them have, to my mind, a master's understanding of the principles of Augustinian exegesis, they're at loggerheads over the issue of interpretation. On the one hand, Trent's injunction seems to make interpretation difficult, if not impossible. But Galileo says, hold on, man. What do physical phenomena have to do with faith and morals? Trent's injunction only extends to the consensus interpretation of the fathers that concerns faith and morals. Bellarmine says, well, okay, in one way you're right. As regards the topic, physical problems, that does have nothing to do with faith and morals. But Bellarmine says, 
but by reason of the speaker, it has everything to do with faith and morals. Meaning, the biblical author is inspired and inerrant, and if he says it, it's true, no matter how mundane. If the biblical author tells you Abraham has X number of children or goats, the number of goats, who really cares? But he said it. And if it's false, you have now evacuated biblical inspiration and inerrancy. And on the issue of accommodation, Bellarmine dismisses Galileo's move out of hand. He says, look, this is so obvious to sense experience. There's no need to accommodate anything. And so they part ways. Galileo goes on to continue his job, Bellarmine his. Bellarmine dies by 1621. Galileo goes off and continues to teach, do experiments, observe, etc. Think about his tidal proof. Well, we'll pick back up again a few years later in 1623, two years after the death of Bellarmine, where a thing happens to Galileo, which if you didn't know the end of the story, you would think is the best thing to happen to this guy, I don't know, since his baptism. Maffeo Barberini, one of whose interventions stopped Copernicanism from being declared formally heretical, remember that guy? He gets elected pope, Pope Boniface VIII. Um, Galileo, these guys had, had a mutual admiration society going on since about 1612. So in 1612, Galileo was part of a public disputation on the nature of why bodies float in water. And Galileo, as always, is against the Aristotelian physicist. The judge of the competition was Maffeo Barberini, who gives Galileo first prize. In 1623, Galileo had wrote a work called Il Saggiatore, the assayer, the scales, the balance, where he essentially takes down a Jesuit astronomer, Orazio Grassi, on the nature of a comet that had recently passed, a comet which Galileo had never seen, by the way. Urban wrote odes to Galileo's rhetorical skill based on, you know, the mutual admiration society. So we got a love fest going on here. So what goes wrong? Well, we'll get there. In 1624, Galileo had six, six private audiences with Urban over the summer. <laughs> sort of, you know, so he's a papal insider in one way or another. What they talk about, we don't know. Maybe they're drinking grappa and smoking cigarettes, I don't know. Urban gives Galileo permission to proceed to write a book on his title proof. If and only if, Galileo speaks, of course, suppositionally in line with the declaration of the Index of Forbidden Books. So Galileo goes back off to Florence to basically work on this book. Now, unknown to Galileo, in 1625, there were two complaints to the Inquisition about him. Um, one had to do with some things he says in Il Saggiatore, are incompatible with the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. It's a bizarre complaint. But once you read it, maybe not so bizarre. Um, and that he openly espouses Copernicanism. Um, he's exonerated of one, and the other is summarily dismissed by a man named Niccolo Riccardi, the Roman censor of books. So they find nothing to see here. It's almost certain Galileo had no idea these complaints were ever lodged, because they disappear so fast. Now, Galileo's book on the tides gets conditionally approved by Niccolo Riccardi, the Roman censor of books, in 1630 on the condition that Galileo make a list of changes. And if and only if these changes are made according to the request of the Holy Office, can he publish his book? First request. As it turns out, Urban has an argument that he thinks will trowel over this whole controversy. So imagine you're Galileo on our road. So, okay, Galileo, look, dude. Doesn't this whole controversy pivot on proof, right? Because, you know, Robert Bellman said if he had proof, we'd have to look at it again. What if proof were impossible? So could it not be that God in his omnipotence can create any number of invisible and undetectable causes for any number of visible phenomena, such that it is in principle impossible 
to know the true causes of any physical phenomenon whatsoever. Before you get too excited about that, it is utter garbage. It evacuates the entire human rational project. It certainly evacuates the scientific project. Because if causes were unknowable, why would one ever pursue to find them, do you see? But Galileo's like, sure thing, boss man, right? <laughs> that's, go that's going in there. Two, Urban requests a change of title. So its eventual title, A Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems, was personally chosen by Urban VIII. Galileo also is supposed to append a preface in which includes the Declaration of the Index from 1616, his assent to it, and a clear indication that he is only engaging in suppositional mathematical stuff, not literal claims. And there are a series of other minor ones. Well, a plague occurs, and Galileo is unable to send the manuscript back to Rome. All mail, no Pony Express, all mail, all travel between Rome and Florence is suspended for a two-year period because of plague. So Galileo just has the thing published in Florence as if he has approval. He tells the Florentinian censor, I made all the changes. He gives it the stamp, and the book is published in 1632, the dialogue concerning the two chief world systems. The form, the literary form of the dialogue, is a four-day discussion, each chapter is a day, uh, between Salviati, a Copernican, Simplicio, an Aristotelian, at the house in Venice, the, Ven the Venetian villa of a man named Segredo. Segredo and Salviati were two deceased friends of Galileo. Simplicio is supposed to stand for Simplicianus, the first great commentator on Aristotle of antiquity. It is also very, very close to Simplicione, which was the 17th century Italian version of simpleton or idiot. And this is in all ways intentional. Now, among astronomers, mathematicians, etc., it's actually quite well received. In fact, Urban's nephew Francesco, who was a cardinal, whom Galileo helped get a doctorate as a return favor to Cardinal Barberini, he has a copy. Somebody takes, borrows Francesco's copy and reads choice passages to Urban VIII. Niccolo, Nic uh, not Niccolo, sorry, Francesco Nicolini, the ambassador to Tuscany, reports that once Urban heard these choice passages, he slams his fist down on the desk, I have been deceived. And he dispatches orders for Galileo to be summoned from Tuscany to appear before the Inquisition. Urban's pissed, y'all. <laughs> the question is, well, why? Well, we have a few plausible candidates. Actually, we got a laundry list of plausible candidates. So first, um, and some of these we get from the official complaint of the Roman censor about the book. First, Urban's argument, which they called the medicine because it was supposed to heal the controversy. Garbage, really, but okay. Is at the end, on the lips of the fool, the last page, the last lines of the second to last lines of the dialogue, Day four, Simplicio, right after the discussion on the title proof, Simplicio says, in true form, because he's a moron, as for the discussion we have had, especially the last part about the explanation of the tides, I really do not understand it completely. So he does not come off as a smart man any time. Indeed, I always keep before my mind's eye a very firm and angelic doctrine which I once heard from a learned man of great knowledge and eminence and before which one must give pause. And then he gives a two-sentence, two, three-sentence version of Irvin's argument, a paraphrase. Salviati says, an admirable and truly angelic doctrine. Anyway, and he starts talking about something else. <laughs> what is Galileo doing? Your guess is as good as mine. As it turns out, Galileo had played fast and loose with a bunch of other changes. He put the exculpatory preface in a different typeset, disconnected from the main body of the book. <laughs> a few other changes he didn't make. Um, in fact, Nicola Riccardi, in at least four different documents I can think of, is obsessing about the fish. So if you would look at a, 
original copy of the dialogue on essentially the publisher's page, which has got you know, Galileo's name when it's published, who published it, there was an emblem of three dolphins swimming kind of almost in a circle, like chasing each other's tail. Uh, Riccardi calls them the fishes. So he's obsessively asking the censor and the publisher, who put the fishes there? Whose idea were the fishes? What are the fishes about? <laughs> so they're dolphins. So Delfino, dolphin in Italian, was a euphemism for someone who was a recipient of nepotism, meaning someone who had got a, a job not because of skill, because of a family f connection. So you'd see that guy, you'd go, Louis Delfino, you know, this guy's a dolphin. Urban is a notorious nepotist. So I already mentioned one nephew who's a cardinal. He's got another nephew who's governor of Rome, this kind of stuff. So they see in this an insult. Thirdly, Galileo appears to argue strongly for the literal truth of the Copernican system when you read the dialogue. And then somebody finds a paper in the archives of the 1616 proceedings which is a record of Galileo's first meeting with Robert Bellarmine. And it outlines exactly what a Galileo agreed to do. Galileo has apparently forgot to mention this agreement. It reads this way. So this is to give you some context. The best this can be reconstructed, and this is pretty much a unanimous uh, opinion in terms of historians, Bellarmine informs Galileo of the index's decision. Galileo agrees. It's false and opposed to scripture, and it cannot be defended or held as literally true. But another man is present, Father Michelangelo Segizzi, Dominican, who was master of the sacred palace and hence head of the holy office. He apparently, whether Galileo, what his face does or whatever, he thinks Bellarmine's promise is not enough. So he steps in and he extracts a much more restrictive promise from Galileo. Segizzi ordered and enjoined the said Galileo, who was himself still present after Bellarmine's warning, to abandon completely the above-mentioned opinion that the sun stands still at the center of the world and the earth moves and henceforth, clue here, all caps, not to hold teach or defend it in any way whatever, ever, either orally or in writing. Otherwise, the Holy Office would start proceedings against him. The same Galileo acquiesced to this injunction and promised to obey. In other words, Galileo promised to not write or speak about Copernicanism ever again, suppositionally or otherwise. Urban says, how come he didn't tell me about this? Now, this document for a long time was thought to be some kind of forgery. Um, and if you ever read that, that is probably not true. It was subjected to handwriting analysis around 2009. And the handwriting on this document matches exactly the handwriting of every other thing by the secretary in the case file in 1616. It is not signed by anyone save the secretary and by curial practice. The, the signature and the notarization of the secretary made it an official document. No other signatures were required. So the balance of the evidence is that Galileo really did agree to this. To pile on, Monsignor Giovanni Ciampoli, one of Urban's secretaries, a friend of Galileo, has been constantly telling Urban the book is going to be great. Cempoli, how's that book going? You're going to love it, Holy Father. You're going to love it. It's going to be great. Well, Cempoli has not only let the Holy Father down, he is suspected with sympathies to the Spanish. Why is that important? Many in Spain are calling for Urban VIII to be deposed. Why? At a consistory of cardinals in 1632, Cardinal Gaspare Borgia, the Vatican ambassador to Spain openly questioned Urban's allegiance to the Roman Catholic faith <laughs> because he was in favor of an alliance between France, the Catholic League of Bavaria, and the Lutheran king of Sweden, Adolphus. Uh, 
And so the Spanish are like, this is how you're going to do us in the Thirty Years' War? And so there's this whole current. They want Urban deposed because of unfaithfulness to the church. Urban's not having a great year. So although Galileo tries to stall, he feigns sickness. He eventually makes it to Rome. Um, it's written back, we're going to send a doctor, and if the doctor thinks you're better, you're coming. And if you refuse, you're coming in chains. Galileo got better, and he went to Rome. <laughs> the whole time, he lives in an apartment of a holy office official. He doesn't spend one day in a jail or in a dungeon, this kind of thing. Um, he eventually is allowed to take carriage rides around the Vatican Gardens. He's got a secretary, these kinds of things. He undergoes a series of depositions, essentially interrogations, in 1633. So during the first, you, Galileo, yes, do you write this? Well, it's been a few months, but yeah, I wrote this. Are you responsible for all the contents in it? Yes, sir. And they show him this injunction. And Galileo says, well, that was like 17 years ago. I'm old. I don't remember exactly what anybody said. I remember cannot be defended or held in any way, whatever. Bellarmine's dead. He can't adjudicate. Galileo says, but I do remember this. And he pulls out, the, he pulls out Bellarmine's certificate with the less restrictive language, which nobody knows about him. So needless to say, it screws up the whole, screws up the whole thing. So he is surprised by the Inquisition, and he in turn surprises the Inquisition. So the first deposition ends. Now, the initial case was formally only, mainly about, did Galileo violate the decision of the Index of Forbidden Books in 1616? In other words, did he argue for the truth of Copernicanism? However, in all, and many, not all, but many official documents, that he didn't inform Urban or the Roman censor of this more restrictive promise is also mentioned as an additional matter an additional crime, but more minor than the first. Now, there are indications after this first deposition that uh, Vincenzo Maculani, who is the interrogator, is more friendly to Galileo than you might suspect. There are indications he wants this done speedily so that everybody wins. Galileo gets punished, but gets punished lightly and kind of with class. So Galileo wins, and he gets to... He gets to going about his business, and the Inquisition and the church and the Pope are going to win because Galileo gets punished. So we have evidence that behind the scenes, Macalani has met with Galileo and is sending messages to Galileo by way of the Tuscan ambassador, Nicolini. So in Galileo's second deposition, he says, well, you were kind enough to give me a copy of my book. I reread it, and you know what? You're right. I can barely believe I wrote this. I don't know what came over me. This really seems to argue strongly for the truth of Copernicanism. He's like, I don't know. Uh, maybe I got too excited, hubris, right? Yeah, whatever. So he basically admits it and throws himself on the mercy of the court. I'm sorry, and whatever, whatever you guys want me to do to make it better, I'll do. So this most certainly um, has something to do with Macalani's intervention. But not everybody thinks the way he does. So Galileo was deposed a third time because now the judges in the Holy Office are now judging the case none friendly to Galileo. They want to ascertain Galileo's motive. So he's asked point blank, in 1616, from that day forward, when you said you no longer believed in Copernicanism, have you believed it since? Galileo's like, no, right? Which is a lie, utter lie, utter lie. <laughs> of course he does, but he's just trying, he's doing what any of us would have done in the circumstances. So it seems hard to believe. So Nicolini eventually asks Urban, he says, okay, how's this going to go? And can you do anything? Urban tells Nicolini, we get this in a, a letter of Nicolini's, the Tuscan ambassador. Urban says, the Holy Office judges will judge what they judge and I couldn't stop it even if I wanted to. Meaning, Urban is not in a political position, you follow what I mean, to stop it. All that would do is make him look worse. So he says, look, man, whatever they decide, they decide, and I'm not in any position to intervene. We have very little indication that Urban wanted to intervene anyway, do you see? 
But he says, nope, my hands, are, my hands are tied, my hands are clean. So Galileo is now summoned a fourth time, and almost certainly to his surprise. He's been told by Nicolini, hey, man, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. He's given a white penitence garment, which is probably an indication to him everything is not fine. So he has now tried, these first things were deposition, he has now tried in the penitent's garment, he has tried and convicted of, quote, vehement suspicion of heresy on the 22nd of June, 1633. Vehement suspicion of heresy is a middle crime between formal heresy and something like erroneous in faith. That middle penalty is skillfully chosen to ensure Galileo's silence. So notice, they don't want to convict him of formal heresy. Do you see? Um, that could have easily been done and was not done. They picked the middle penalty to essentially ensure his silence because Galileo were to relapse, he would be automatically guilty of formal heresy and could be turned over to the secular arm to be burned, executed, whatever. So that's to keep Galileo silent, which is essentially their intention, just to get him to stop talking and writing and get out of the way. Galileo was never tortured, by the way anything of the kind. He is, as a formal part of the proceeding, shown the instruments of torture, which every, that happened every time you were doing this. So he has to recite an abjuration where he has to formally abjure geokineticism and heliocentrism, probably utterly humiliated. And of course he does so. It is a myth that as Galileo is leaving the proceedings, he turns around, and yet it moves. He had never made it out of the room, people. Like, <laughs> if that would have happened, this story would have ended much worse than it ended. Um, it is also a myth that the inquisitors or cardinals refused to look through the telescope. The only guy that refused was a philosopher, and he refused to look a second time because he got nauseated looking through the first time. <laughs> so Jesuits had confirmed every data point of Galileo's. Even uh, Christopher Clavius, who was the preeminent Jesuit astronomer of his day, said, look, I'm no Copernican but we have to come up with a theory that can account for these data points because Ptolemy cannot. Now, all but three cardinals signed Galileo's sentence. Francesco Barberini does not sign it. He finds somewhere else to be that day. Probably his form of protest and disapproval of the decision. So Galileo's uh, penalty is to recite the seven penitential psalm once a week for three years and to be imprisoned at the pleasure of the Holy Office. The imprisonment is computed, computed, is uh, commuted on the spot in the room. He never spends a day in jail. He lives uh, first at the Villa Medici, then with his friend, the Archbishop of Siena, for six months, then lives under house arrest at his own villa until he dies um, in 1642. Now, um, Galileo's daughter, Sister Maria Celeste, a cloistered for Claire, uh, receives permission of the Holy Office to do her father's penance for him, which is also one of the more touching parts of the story. He's got nothing better to do, so he continues to write, but not on Copernicanism, even though behind the scenes he helps his dialogue concerning two chief world systems to be translated and published in other languages on the continent. So he's doing this on the sly. But what does, else does he do? He returns to the experiments in terrestrial mechanics of his days at Padua and publishes them in a book called The Two New Sciences. So look, people, in Newton's Principia, when he says, I have only seen Father because I stand on the shoulders of giants, and he mentions Galileo, it's those experiments, not the telescope business. In fact, Galileo's main contributions to modern physics as we know it, he made at Padua, and he only gets around to reworking and publishing because he's condemned and he has nothing else to do. Now, of course, it's a hypothesis contrary to fact. He might have gotten around to it otherwise. Who knows? But what we do know is that's why he did. So sometimes, in fact, all the time, y'all, God writes straight with crooked lines. So Galileo eventually dies in 1642, dies blind, humiliated. Over the next 200 years, you'll see things begin to ecclesially to shift as the empirical case for heliocentrism becomes stronger. So by 1741, all of Galileo's works can be published. So they're taken off of the index. By 1758, the general prohibition of heliocentric, helios, excuse me, of heliocentrism is lifted. 
So work can no longer be put on the index for being heliocentric or Copernican. In fact, significantly, in 1820, the censor of books, Filippo Anfossi, a Dominican, tries to stop the publication of a book by Giuseppe Satelle, a famous Jesuit astronomer, on the grounds that he defends Copernicanism. The Dominican head of the Holy Office overturns Anfossi's decision and says, look, man, this has been proved. What are we doing? Like, there's no longer any reason to do this. So... On September the 11th, 1822, the Holy Office issues a decree to the censors that if you try to stop a book being published on the grounds of Copernicanism, you will be subject to canonical penalties. This is something, in fact, Galileo prophetically predicts in 1616. There will come a day, he says, when one will be ecclesially punished for not being a Copernican. This is not exactly it, but it's close how times have changed. Satelle's book, Receiving the Imprimatur, the Nihil Obstat, if you've ever seen those in older, older books, meaning that there's nothing in here harmful to Catholic faith, juridically overturns the Holy Office's 1616 condemnation of Copernicanism. It does not, however, overturn Galileo's personal condemnation. We'll have to wait a long time for that. By 1835, all heliocentric works are dropped from the index. They go through the whole index, take all of them off. 1893, Pope Leo XIII writes the first papal encyclical on the Bible, Providentissimus Deus, where conveniently in the section about faith and science and interpreting the Bible in light of science, his use of St. Augustine is, reminiscently, is reminiscent of Galileo's particular use of St. Augustine in laying out principles of how to properly interpret the Bible in terms of physical matters. It's 1893, not 1993, so there's no way he's going to mention Galileo favorably in that context. 1942, there's the tercentennial of Galileo's death, commemorated by the Pontifical Academy of the Sciences, celebrated by Vatican Radio. 1979 to 1992, Pope St. John Paul II starts the project of reopening the Galileo affair and the Galileo case, which culminates... In 1992, his rehabilitation of Galileo, where he formally and publicly rehabilitates Galileo, calling his trial an injustice and affirming that Galileo's understanding of the Bible in terms of science was superior to those who opposed it. He puts it this way. The geocentric representation of the world was commonly admitted in the culture of the time as fully agreeing with the Bible, the teaching of the Bible. The problem posed by theologians of that age was, therefore, that of the compatibility between heliocentrism and Scripture. Now listen to this. Thus, the new science, with its methods and the freedom of research which they implied, obliged theologians to examine their own criteria of scriptural interpretation. I want to talk about science curing or purifying religion from superstition and error creating an obligation on the part of theologians to reinterpret Scripture. Paradoxically, or most of them did not know how to do so, including Dr. of the Church, St. Robert Bellarmine. Paradoxically, Galileo, a sincere believer, showed himself to be more perceptive in this regard than the theologians who opposed him. So in sum, what can we take away from this? First, the whole affair, it seems to me, either from the perspective of Galileo and Copernicanism's encounter with Bellarmine and the Inquisition, was never about the compatibility of faith and reason in principle. All players agreed that the truth was one, and ultimately truths of faith and reason could not conflict if properly understood, because this is all so much Catholic boilerplate. Of course everyone agreed on this. Two, probably more interestingly, the affair was not evidence of a historical, programmatic, institutional, anti-science, anti-reason posture program of the big bad Catholic Church. There's a reason why Galileo's specter is the only one called forth from the afterlife. He's the only specter they got. The Galileo affair, in terms of the church universal, has not one good analog before or after. There have been regional disputes, but there's never been on the part of the church universal 
anything like it before or since. It, in other words, is utterly singular, which is precisely why it stands out, because that is what glaring exceptions do. One of these things is not like the other, and that is the Galileo affair. Um, all respect to Neil deGrasse Tyson, which means not very much, although <laughs> documents relating to the heresy trial of Giordano Bruno in 1600 were lost. Actually, Napoleon's guys lost them between taking them from Rome, bringing them to the Louvre. Um, and Robert Bellarmine was one of the judges at Bruno's trial. Um, to the end of life, he was crying, trying to get Bruno to sort of recant, and was all torn up because the guy didn't, didn't recant before being executed. There's really no good evidence that Bruno's trial has anything to do with anything properly scientific. So if he is ever called forth as an analog, it does not do the job. It seems to me, rather, this affair was about the changing nature of the scientific enterprise. Realism versus instrumentalism in astronomy, new physics, that's mathematical, observational, experimental, a changing intellectual paradigm. But not only that, and this is probably more relevant for us, it was also about theologians and an embattled post-Reformation church that was utterly incapable of using its own resources to confront a problem in biblical interpretation. Resources it had in St. Augustine, ready-made. So you can't ever forget, um, until the Reformation, as long as anybody could remember, we would call it either religious hegemony or monopoly. The church has. Whenever a body has that kind of hegemony or monopoly, a religious body or a political body, it doesn't much matter, boundary-pushing positions are generally tolerated quite a bit because you feel safe. So Copernicus can talk about heliocentrism, etc., and nothing really happens. But whenever those bodies feel threatened or are threatened, those tolerances, almost like a law, are withdrawn, do you see? And boundary-pushing positions are rarely tolerated. A friend of Galileo's writes him in 1616, and he says, Look, dude, Paul V, our pope now, he hates the liberal arts. He's closed-minded. This age, he says, is not the age for new ideas. It's, it's utterly amazing how, how this guy saw. He said, so why don't you stop and keep it to yourself, or it's going to end badly. That guy read his own age, as few of us rarely do, correctly. So it is a crisis in biblical interpretation and not being able to use the resources of our own tradition. Paradoxically, Galileo was able to do so in an area that was not his area of expertise, biblical interpretation and could see better than others could. Now, if one wants to say that the church treated Galileo in an authoritarian fashion, fair enough. It's 1633! It's an authoritarian age. <laughs> if one in similar circumstances is not treated in an authoritarian way, that is the exception rather than the rule. Might you want to say the new science has in its own DNA as a practice a freedom of research which it demands. Fine. It's 1633 with a post-Reformation in battle church. Um, that very few were able to see this. Uh, may not be excusable, however one wants to define that term, but it certainly is not implausible or unexpected. So the Galileo affair in sum personal, historical, ecclesial scandal. And this is true, so I use scandal in the, term of the, in the sense of the Greek uh, term scandalon, as in this pebble in your shoe or your sandal <laughs> that irritates you as you walk. It's been the gift that keeps on giving. You understand? This one thing has been the most valuable thing in the arsenal of all of those who want to heap derision upon the faith for being irrational and anti-scientific. So it was then, is now, and will probably perpetually be a kind of scandal that will harm the faith and be a blockade or an obstacle for somebody taking the faith seriously, taking Jesus seriously and His church seriously. So what I'm hoping at hearing this talk that all of us can be in a better position as we think through these issues 
And issues like them, they come up with you and your own thinking, your own world, however large that world extends, you and your students, um, that we'll be in a better position by learning lessons from this affair that at the very least, because all you can control is you, that you and I will at the very least not present a scandal or a blockade of this kind. Because at least we've tried to listen to history and learn a little bit from it. So thank you for your time.